It's very important that we get a little bit of context. Isaiah, as a prophet, was a cousin of the king. Okay? It's very important that you understand that. Why? Because in chapter 6, in verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, I'm reading from the Amplified Version, I saw in a vision the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, with the train of his royal robe, filling what the most holy part of the temple. Above him, seraphim, heavenly beings, stood. Each had six wings, with two wings, they covered his face, with two wings he covered his feet, and with two wings he flew, and one called out to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. What a wonderful scripture that we use so many times. Now, let me tell you the meaning of Uzziah. Uzziah means hope. So it says there, in the year that the hope died, I saw the Lord. In the year that I thought that there was no more hope for me, I get to see this vision. And in this vision, I see the Lord and I get to see an open heaven. So how it is that in the moment in which hope dies, we get to see the Lord because built in you now is faith. Now you have to grab a hold of faith based on what you've been told so that you can grow that character that makes you wait even when what your eyes are seeing is not precisely the best of your time and your season. Is anybody getting me? Yeah. Does it make any sense? Amen. Amen. So when when I when I was preparing to come in here and spoke about this, I couldn't help myself to go through the vision of Isaiah, understanding his human position. Yes, he was a prophet of the Lord, but also he was the cousin of the king, and now the king has died. And Isaiah was a prophet that used to be around, you know, the court groups. He used to be around the palace. And now my relationship, my atmosphere, my circumstance is changing. Oh, how good that when everything is changing and when it seems that hope is dying, I get to see that heaven opens and I get to see the Lord. And I get to see the holiness of the Lord. So in that moment, Isaiah's vision gives him hope for what is coming. Because when we go now to the next chapter, chapter 7, let me give you a little bit of history. Between chapter 6 and chapter 7, more than 20 years have passed. The son of Hosea, his name was Jotham. And Jotham was king over the nation. And by this time, the kingdoms were divided. They were kings over Judah, the kingdom of Judah. Okay? And by this time now, Jotham has reigned and died. And now in chapter 7, we have the grandson of Uzziah. His name was Ahaz. So let's start reading on chapter 7, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that resting king of Aram, Syria, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but they could not conquer it. Let me stop right there. So Isaiah now has spent 20 something years he knows there is a hope. He has seen the son of Uzziah, Jotham, being king. Jotham, if you go back to 1 Kings, you will see that he was actually a very good king for Israel. He did and he followed the ways of the Lord. But now he has died and now his son, Uzziah, or Ahaz, should I say better, 
Ahaz is reigning over Israel. And if you go back to the book of Kings, you will see that Ahaz was not precisely doing the best before the Lord. He was not following the footsteps of his grandfather and even his father. However, I need you to understand that 20 something years before, Isaiah, Isaiah saw that there was a hope. Isaiah saw that the Lord was present. Isaiah saw that even when things are not working well around, God is present and you have a hope to believe that it will get better. Amen? Amen. So when, when now Isaiah is looking at this king, Ahaz, now this king Ahaz is in trouble. His nation, the nation of Judah, the kingdom of Judah is in trouble. Why is it in trouble? Because the Syrians were looking again to wage war against them. And I love, however, how it says in the verse, it says, against it, comma, but they could not conquer it. From the get-go, God is telling you, hey, there might be war against you, but it will not conquer you. It will not take you over. It will not do anything wrong against you. But I need you now to have a hope. Amen? Amen. Because sometimes when war is waging against us, for some reason, we forget about our hope. We forget about the word of the Lord. We forget about the warranty and the benefit that he has given us in order for us to embrace faith and just stand still until war is over. Amen? Amen. It says, but this is the difference between a man that has God and a man that doesn't have a hope in God. A man that has a hope in God, somebody that doesn't have any hope in God. This is the attitude of Ahaz, verse 2. When the house of David, which is Ahaz, or Judah, was told, Aram is alive with Ephraim, Israel, the hearts of Ahaz and his people tremble as the trees of the forest tremble in the wind. Why it is that when it gets hard, we have a tendency to let our minds go and let our hope go. Over the past year, Many things have been going on in my personal life. And how many of you know that life is just life? Mm -hmm. Things happen. Can we agree on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do I have real people here? Yeah. Real people. Mm -hmm. Not religious people. Real. Mm -hmm. People that really do need to grab a hold on hope and faith. Because you've heard the Lord for so many years telling you a word, giving you a hope, and then there come the suddenness that doesn't suit you that well. So over the past year, many things have been going on in my life. But I do have a word, I do have a hope. However, sometimes you begin to work within the prophetic word that, that you've been given. You begin to do your part. Let me tell you this. The prophetic needs that you do your part. You do the possible. It is God's problem to do the impossible, but it's your thing to do the possible. Amen. Because there are many people that sit down to wait on the prophetic as if it's magic. It's not magic, people. It requires that you go back to the heart of the Lord. It requires that you go back to seek for more. It requires that you get more into Him so that you will get fulfillment, so that you will learn to hear His voice, so that He can truly guide you, so that His Spirit can truly, truly grab you by the hand because you're a son and a daughter of God. 
And the testimony that you are a son and a daughter of God is that you are guided by the Holy Ghost. As for Romans chapter 8. So as I am walking in my process, I am finally confronted with something that the Lord has spoken to me. But I was kind of myself. I was kind of, eh, let's deal with this later. I love my country. Uh, with all the issues that you can imagine any country can have, I love my country. And I love my family, and I love my church, and I love my business, and I love the people that I work with, and I love my team, and I am comfortable. And the Lord confronted me with that. The Lord told me, hey, many things have already been fulfilled, and you are very much comfortable. I need you to start stepping into the gas because there's more to come. And I've been asking you to start preparing your way out of your home. And when God began to remind me of his word and his demand for my life to move to the States, to open up ministry in the States, to move business to the States, he asked me to go first all by myself and then later on to take my family with me. Oh, I have to be very honest with you. Can I be transparent? Can I be real? Yeah. I didn't like it. Why? Because I was comfortable. Because in the space in which I am right now, I knew how to do everything and nothing was weird and everything was familiar. And my faith was set. Do I have people here? Yes. Am I talking to somebody here? Yes. My faith was set. And I went to the Lord and I even tried to negotiate. Have anybody here has tried to negotiate? Yes. And I tried to negotiate. He said, Lord, can we hold this off for like two years, three years? And he said, no. Say, but, but, I'm serving you. I'm doing well. <laughs> I don't like what I cannot control. Yeah. Is there somebody here? Yeah. Don't lift your hands or your feet. <laughs> I don't like it, Lord. And he came back to me and he told me, haven't I given you a word? And I said, yes, Lord. And then he asked me, have you believed? Let me, let me make that question. He asked me, have you believed my word for real? Are you letting your hope grow as your faith grow to start something? Push through it until you finish it. Because most of the times we start things but we don't push through. And because we don't push through, and sometimes then as time passes by we look back and sometimes we even dare to go before the Lord and say oh you have forgotten about me he has not forgotten he placed the demand before you he gave you the hope so that you can build the faith so that you can push through until you finish it until you get the actual and factual result. So the Lord took me to this process of a 40 day prayer and fasting. And he ended up that prayer and fasting telling me this. You think this is as it is in sports. In sports we always say, Ready, set, go. He told me, no, it doesn't work like that in faith. In faith, it works. Go, set, and then you will be ready. And God has a way 
he always has this peculiar way of when you become a bit difficult, he makes it interesting. <laughs> and business, immediately after I was presenting a little bit of resistance, business and, and financials in the business began to go down. And I was like, oh, but we're doing everything well. Our, our KPIs, our clients are happy. And uh, what's going on? And the Lord said, it's either you start getting on the move and you will, or you will lose everything. I'm asking you to step out in faith. I'm asking you to step out in hope. I believe I came here today to tell you that the Lord is asking many of you to step out in hope, to step out in faith and grow. Now, as I was reading the scripture, I hear what the Lord said to Isaiah on chapter seven, verse three, when it says, then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, king of Judah, you and your son, Shear Jesub, at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool in the highway to the fuller's field, and say to him, Take care and be calm. Do not fear and be weak because of these two stumps of smoldering logs on account of the fierce anger of King Brazim and Aram and of the son of Remaliah, Becca, a sorcerer of the throne of Israel. See? When you are in this process that God is asking from you to step on the gas for hope and faith, he will always find a way to send you a word. He will always find a way to send you a word. Now, I need to tell you this little fact so that you understand this better. When the Lord asked prophet Isaiah to go with his son, Shear Jacob, he is asking not only to the prophet to present himself to the king and give him a word. He is asking, give him a word, but give him a word with a sign. Because by that time, whenever a prophet or his sons were presented together, it was the word of the Lord finding you accompanied by a sign. And Shear Jacob means the Lord will send a remnant for this nation. See, the Lord was telling Ahaz, hey, you know what? Even though there is a threat, even though they are trying to wage war against you, even though they are trying to do you wrong, let me tell you this. First of all, take calm and be and be and have hope because they were burning, but now they are too small in love. They have no fire no more. The first thing that the Lord wants to tell you tonight is the threat that you think is burning in fire for you has no fire. Has no fire. There's no fire coming against you that the Lord cannot take down. But now if you can not only hear it, I'm bringing with it a sign. I am giving you a sign, Ahaz, because I need you to understand, I need you to believe that even though you're not doing so well, I have a commitment with the house of Judah. Because why was it that the Lord was guaranteeing protection for the house of Judah? Because there was a commitment. Let me tell you this, if the Lord has committed with you, he will not fail his promise with you. If the Lord has committed with you that he will keep you safe and he will keep your children safe and he will keep your things safe, he is committed, he won't fail you. He won't fail you. So as I kept on going on in this argument with the Lord, I began to do my move. And can I be honest? It is scary when the Lord is asking you to move to a place in which you know nobody. Because if the Lord would have asked me to move to New York or to New Jersey or to Florida or to Georgia or to North Carolina, which I met, I know 
everybody there from up and down ministries, businesses, everything. Oh, no, 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 no. He told me, I want you to move to Houston, Texas. Who do I know in Houston, Texas? Zero. I want you to start building business there. I want you to start making and knowing, make, making people get to know your business, and I want you to start doing ministry relationships. And I didn't know where to go. Like, I have no idea. I, I, I knew nobody, literally. But I began doing my move, having my pillar of hope and the word that he has given me. He told me, I am moving you. I am opening space for you. I am giving you more than, you have, than what you have already in your hand. I am multiplying you by seven times more. And I am starting at ground zero. Am I talking to somebody here? At ground zero. And I said, okay, Lord. So I bought it, my first trip to Houston. I got there. I got accommodated. I rented a car. And if I tell you what I did the first weekend that I was there, you probably won't believe me. But it was actually what I did. All that I did was drive around and pray. That was all. Drive around. Get to know the places. I visited few churches. I just drove around and prayed. And as I was praying, I was declaring the word. And you know what? When began to happen inside of me, hope began to grow. That was the first weekend. I stayed there for a week. By the fourth day, the Lord began giving me instructions. Go to this place, find this other place, go to meet this person. He was just giving me information and names and numbers, making me, make, making those things come to my hand. And I began to be calmed. And what was waging war against my business in my hometown, in Puerto Rico, it began to just recede. Business went up again. Things went up again. As I was following the word of the Lord in hope, in hope, and letting it build my faith. Amen? By that time, I began then receiving the word of the Lord through my pastors and the people that I submit into in ministry and then began saying, Jesse, this is just a moment. Just have the hope. We believe this is the moment of the move for you. So you are doing well. We're supporting you. Just start doing it. And you'll see how the Lord will begin to open doors for you. And that did happen. Then as we are just doing this move, as we are just moving everything and starting you know, to get the connections and all that, and we have a final day for the move and all of that, then a suddenly came. Something that I was not expecting for real. I went to my doctor for a regular physical, and as I went to my doctor for a regular physical, he asked me, can I do a sonogram of your neck? And I said, of course, doctor. Do whatever you have to do. I just need a clean bill, you know, of health. And he said, mm, I saw something that I don't like. That was coming November, December. And I said, OK, God, let's deal with it. So it turned out that I was growing a cancerous nodule in my throat. And he said, I think we need to go into surgery. And I went back to the Lord and I said, I don't get it. Why are you asking me to step on the gas on doing these things and move to a place in which I will be by myself? And then this happens. I don't get this. And the Lord said to me, that is one fire that I am going to turn down. Mm -hmm. Just trust. Mm -hmm. Let me work. Let me work. Go into treatment. Do not let him cut you. Go into treatment. You'll see what I will do in three months. 
So as I kept on stepping on the gas in hope and in faith, I kept on doing treatment for my throat. And by February, before I came here in March, I got a clean bill of health. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing is in my throat. Nothing is in my thyroid. Amen? Amen. Why? Because the Lord was trying to give me a sign that I am doing the right thing and He's taking care of everything. God is trying to communicate with you continuously. And He's trying to establish you in a hope that will build your faith. So this was the way of the Lord to establish me in a hope that will build my faith. Now, See, Isaiah tells this to Ahaz, the king, and then from verse 4 until verse 7 or 8, it gives him a prophetic word of how it's going to come down. See, when the Lord is about to ask for a demand of hope and faith in you, he will give you a word and he will tell you the specifics of how things are going to happen. Now, it is very important that you understand your role in this process. Why? Because on verse 9, on the second part of verse 9, it says, If you will not believe and trust in God and his message, be assured that you will not be established. Now, that very same sentence can be completely rewritten in the positive. Which means, if you believe in God and His message, then you will be established. Then you will be for sure made mature and grown. What surprises me though, it's in verse 10, when Ahaz reacts to that word. So I here have a prophet stand before you and he tells you, sweetheart, all you have to do is believe. And if you believe, I will establish you. I am telling you and I am even giving you a sign that what is threatening you cannot harm you. Be calm, everything is going to be fine. How many of you would like God to ask a word like that with you? Everything is going to be well. Everything is going to be good. Hey, sweetheart, and all you have to do is have hope, have faith. All you have to do is truly render yourself into the word of the Lord, what he has told you. Everything you have to do is truly believe that, yeah, you will not be in that job forever. Because you have asked God for something more. If you believe, you will be established. Now, in the process of believing and being established, you will be called out to step on the gas and do your part. Amen? Amen. Can you understand that? Yes. In the process of asking God, do something more for me, He is demanding from you more faith. He is demanding from you, step out. And do not second guess what I tell you to do. Because sometimes you second guess God. But he is telling you, if you believe my message, I will establish you. Amen? Amen. Can you understand that? Now, you are given a chance to have God before you, to have God in your relationship telling you, hey, I am telling you a word, I am giving you a word, hey, I am giving you a message, believe it and I will establish. But sometimes we take the attitude of Ahaz. Then the Lord spoke against to King Ahaz saying, ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God one that will convince you that God has spoken and will keep his word. Make your request as deep as shale or as high as heaven. I believe in my heart that the pillar of hope that the Lord wants to lift before you has to do with how much are you willing 
to have the faith to believe God and ask for a sign. And ask God to do something for you because you know why God gives Ahaz the opportunity to ask for a sign? Because God knows that sometimes we may have issues with not believing. In his mercy, he understands that there are days in which it's more difficult to believe than others. And since he is a, such a good, good father, and he understands you, he's not judging you nor sentencing you for that. He's asking you, hey, if it's difficult, ask me for a sign. If you cannot deal with this, ask me for a sign. If you feel you cannot do this, ask me for a sign. And he is assuring you, I am the Lord God, your father. You're my son. You're my daughter. Ask me for a sign because I have a commitment and a word with you. However, if God stands before you today, present, and he tells you, ask me for a sign, would you give yourself into the faith process? of asking for a son. By March, when I was coming here, the Lord asked me that. I was good in my health. I was about to open my first office in Houston. There was a lot of stress going on. And I was coming here. And believe me, coming here, it's a process. <laughs> it's a real process. So I said, God, I'm overwhelmed. Are you asking me now to ask you for a sign? You are doing this. I'm pushing forward. And he said to me, yeah, Jesse, but I understand that you're overwhelmed, that you're tired, that you feel drained. And I get it. If you need it, ask for a sign. And I asked. And I was following the instructions. I was following the instruction to the team. A sign that will convince me that God has spoken and he will keep his word. Make your request as deep or as high. Which means make it difficult. <laughs> That's what it means in simple words. Don't tell me, God, is that my lady? And then ask me, if she sits by my side, she is. Yeah. <laughs> no. It doesn't work like that. No. Now, let me tell you this. What's the interesting thing about asking God for a sign? What's the interesting faith process? is that it will make you feel like you are in a water tank, in a fish tank, and you're the last fish there, and everybody is waiting for you to be dead. When I was little, I used to have fish tanks. I love the sea. I live near the beach. I used to have a fish tank with a lot of goldfishes. Now you have to understand that in my love for the goldfishes, I wanted to feed them all day. And I throw them cheese, and crackers, and milk, and juice, and I killed them. <laughs> That's what happened. They were, they were getting dead, you know, they were dying one by one, little by little, until my mother told me, you cannot do that. And there was only one goldfish in the tank. And I was actually, I was so disappointed that the goldfish, you know, they were dying. I was trying to be good at them, and I was trying to feed them well. And they were dying on me. It was like, huh? It's an insult to me. Hello? <laughs> so there was this last coach. And I remember that I would wake up every day and I would go to the fish tank and I would look. Hey, goldfishy. Hey, are you there? The goldfish will swipe before my face and it was swimming all the way around and it lasted me like a year. So when I was placed 
in a spot in which my faith was being tested with a sign. I felt like that goldfish. Why? Because I felt like everybody was looking at me in my whole process because I was living my process in front of everybody. And everybody was looking at me and expecting me, oh, Jesse, oh, she pushed it too hard now. This is, this is not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And I felt like that goldfish that everybody was expecting to be dead by the next day. But you know what? When I went to the Lord with my sign and with the whole process, I heard the Lord saying, oh no, sweetheart, you will not be like the goldfish. Instead, the next time anybody will try to see on top of the fish tank to see if you're dead, they will see you walking upon the waters. Let me establish this very last point. When it's about time for you to grow in your faith and go to the next level and dimension in your hope and your faith, when it comes the time in your life in which God will not wait no more for you because things need to happen. See, when Abraham, in chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, left his uh, uh, original land, he was told that he was going to have a son. Chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16, chapter 17, and 25 years went by. But by chapter 18, when it was about time for him, and he was already 100 years old, and Sarah was already 90 years old. When it was time for it to happen, because God needs it to happen now. No more chapters were going to go by. No more chapters were going to keep on going on, no. Now is the time of the Lord. Hey, Abraham, I'm calling you before my presence, and I will even change your name if I have to. And I am asking you to change Sarai's name as well, because this has to happen now. There are things in your mind that has to happen now, that cannot wait for tomorrow, that has to happen now. Why? Because if you don't let God push you to the process of faith so that it happens now, you are taking away from the blessings of the Lord for the fulfillment of what he has already told you that he was going to do with you. And I don't know how many of you want that. I don't want it. I want the fulfillment of the Lord. I want his promises completed in my life. I want to reach to the place he called me to reach. Do I have anybody here that wants that? Yes. There is a moment in which God tells you it is now. And that's why I like so much what Isaiah tells Ahaz because he says, you know what? If you will not give me a sign, then I, the Lord, will put a sign myself. If you don't have the faith, I am not a man that lies. I will put a demand on myself and I will make it difficult. A virgin shall conceive. A virgin will give birth to a son. Something that naturally it's impossible to happen, but I will make it happen. And when I will make it happen, what will birth out of that sign is God with us. Emmanuel, the sign that God is with you. Amen? Amen. So I believe I came here to share just this reflection to put a demand on you. I believe there is a demand of the Lord for each and every one of you. Why? Because there are things that need to happen now. There are things that need to go on now. And it's about time that you step out in faith and push until you have Oh, feel
So many of you have been awaiting for the Lord, sitting down with your arms lifted, I worship you, I worship you, I worship you. But it's not about the worship only, it's about the factual demand of faith that you have placed in your life, that you have led God to put into your life so that you can move on forward, so that you can push on until you reach the end and factual result. I remember a few years ago, I told the people in my church, you know what? I don't want this to be a church of one too many programs, but no factual results. I told the people in my church, I know we can make a good program. I know we can throw a good event. But according to the vision that God gave to this house, are we getting the end results? I remember that year when I asked the church that, the Lord told me, drop down the program of the church. No more activities. I want you guys to go back to your knees and I want you to truly seek into my heart. Is to see if you have truly believed what I have spoken to you. At that moment, my church was going through a crisis, so to speak. We have lost many people that went out to the States. It was actually after the hurricane came past through our island, and many people, because of the positions that the island was left, they needed to move out to the States to make a living, you know, with their families. So out of a 250 people congregation, we were left probably with 60 or 50 people. And that was not easy to deal with. But the Lord said, forget about the program, go back to your needs, and please do make sure that you go inside my heart and you build up the faith and build up the character so that I will be able to fulfill the vision that I have given you for this house. And you know what? I had no electricity, I had no water service in the building of the house. I, I had nothing. It was very difficult to deal with. So within those 50 or 60 people, all that we could do was meet at the houses. But the Lord told me, I give you three months to build me up, these 50 to 60 people. I give you three months to build them up so that they can receive people in their homes. It took my island a whole and a half, one year and a half, to build up itself again with electricity, with water, with everything. It was so difficult. But by the end of the year and a half, when we were able to meet again in our church, in our building, I had a 500 people congregation. Wow. Why? Because it takes a process of faith and to really believe God and to really understand science. You're not throwing science out of quirks. No, I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you begin to throw science here and there and everywhere out of a quirk or, or a discomfort that you're having. No, no, no. I'm talking to people that mean business with God. I'm talking to people that mean business and they do really want to grow in their faith and they do really want to see God do wonders. I am believing for the God of wonders. I am believing for the God that truly opens doors, not the God that manipulates people to make them believe that it is God. No, the God that truly still performs miracles. That's the God that I am experiencing. And that's the God that is expecting for his sons and daughters, according to Romans chapter 8, to manifest. The earth is waiting for us to manifest. Now, a year after this whole process personally begun in my life, I'm here again, but I have opened not one, two business office in Houston, Texas. Wow. And when on my way back, I'm going to search for my house for my family. And hopefully, 
my one will come. Amen to that. I swear. <laughs> okay? But you know what? It is all because of God. It is all because I have chosen to believe and push through even when many people surrounding me were not able to believe with me. Oh, because let me tell you something. Sometimes you're expecting that people believe with you, but there's nobody to believe with you. There are things that sometimes you have to do on your own. Are we here? Yes. And I have learned to tell those people, oh, you know what, I love you. Stay there sitting. Do not corrupt my atmosphere of faith. <laughs> because I am calling things based on what I have believed in God. I have a hope. I have a hope. I have a hope. Amen. Amen.